I'm Joe LaBeouf, um, and uh, I am a retired Army colonel who uh, spent uh, the last eight or last ten years of his career on the faculty at West Point as a, as a member of the permanent faculty. Transitioned to, to, to the faculty at uh, Duke University, Duke School of Business, and spent uh, 13 years as a professor there. Uh, and I uh, have now transitioned to my third journey of work, kind of trying to figure out how I make a difference and matter. Uh, but one of the things that, that I was unable to do was last year I was asked to join the McGowan Foundation as a trustee, became an official trustee uh, this past summer. I'm uh, Chuck Allen. I'm a retired colonel in the United States Army, 30 years of active duty service. I'm currently the Associate Professor of Leadership and Cultural Studies at the United States Army War College. I've been on the faculty for a total of 17 years there, five years of active duty, and it's my 12th year as a, as a civilian faculty member now. So my task today was to talk about this concept of strategic leadership. And the organizational model of leadership has someone in charge that provides very specific direction and motivation to members of the organization. And I teach about leadership at the higher level uh, of institutions, this idea of looking across time, across organizational boundaries, but also across impact on societies. Okay. So in 1991, the United States Army was looking toward the 21st century, trying to understand what leadership was required to be successful for the institution. And they came up with a difference in the environment that was needed to be addressed. So this idea of uh, strategic environment was VUCA, which meant that the characteristics, it was characterized by uh, three major components. One, a sense of volatility that there was a high rate of change that occurred, not only in what we knew, information flow, technology, but also in terms of how people interact with each other. There was also this idea of uncertainty, the inability to be certain and predicting outcomes with cause and effect. The third thing was complexity, understanding that the environment had a lot of interdependencies, a lot of actors, a lot of relationships, and then that there was second and third order effects to decisions that would uh, maybe push back on implementation of decisions. And the last one is ambiguity. This idea of interpretation of data information uh, seems to be dependent on individuals, perspectives, and challenges to what information actually uh, means or can be uh, decided upon. Me, from my point of view, I've added a C to another C, so it's B-U-C-C-A. One of the things that I've seen is that leaders have to be able to change organizations and adapt rapidly. So, so changing an organization means you have to be a behavioral change agent. You've got to be able to change individuals' point of view. And so learning how to be a, an effective change agent, I think, is part, is what, is part of that, that VUCA, um, in the environment. It's an environment that's ever-changing mm -hmm. uh, in ways that we, we haven't seen, you know, back when Chuck and I were in the service. 25, 30 years ago, we were fighting one enemy, that was the Soviet Union, so things were pretty static in many ways. And, but these days, it's much different. There seems to be an interpretation that VUCA is something new. If you look back at the history of our nation and our military, folks have always been involved with this idea that they can't predict. There's inconsistency, information interpretation, et cetera. So this idea that the landscape is VUCA is something that we have to get the leaders to understand and accept and then develop the skills to be successful in that environment. The metaphor I use is downhill skiing. You're on top of a hill, you look down the field, and you try to pick where you're gonna go, but as you ski down the hill, you have to adjust the terrain. If you have to ski around moguls, you have to pick the trail, but you have to be very clear about what you're trying to accomplish, get down the hill safely, and then how you negotiate the terrain with shifting your weight, sensing the terrain as you move down is important. So the some folks will use VUCA as a, an excuse to say this is too hard. No, it's the terrain that you have to be able to navigate, so you have to develop the skills and competencies to be successful. And this metaphor is important because I think it set the context for the, the major part of our conversation. I, as a ski instructor, you know, I, I've skied a lot of bad terrain, but the principles of skiing don't change. Mm -hmm. It's how you leverage them when it comes to where, where the train, how the train's structured and what it enables you to do. Is that strategic leadership, that leadership fundamentally is not just about the leader. That leaders have to operate through others and then adapt, adapt their leadership to context. So it's leader-led in a situation. Okay, we tend to talk about leadership as if it's the individual behavior of just one person. And people are, not, are really not effective alone. Okay, and so um, strategic leadership are able to apply fundamental enduring leadership principles, but around different actors 
in a different context. That it's not some kind of new leadership. You know, it's it's enduring principle-based leadership just applied in a different context. I think it's helpful to understand the Army's definition of leadership. We call it a process of influence to achieve the organizational mission. So we have a definition that says is to provide purpose, direction, and motivation to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. That fits a lot of different contexts, a lot of different industries, a lot of different organizational experiences. And then how you implement that may uh, be modified and shift a little bit based upon the level that you're in. If you're on the factory floor, in a parking lot, or an office space, there's very specific ways of doing things. Very much routine, so you have certainty in terms of how a task is accomplished. As you move up, there's certain policy directions and guidance that you may have that provides you some leeway. Strategic leadership is focused not only on the organizational alignment down and in, but also being aware of the boundaries that exist in the organization, the impact of environmental factors, and understanding here again that the organization really exists to serve some other stakeholder or some other client. And so a strategic leader has to look outside, look long over the time horizons, but also understand their value to stakeholders that make them relevant to the organization, uh, organizational leaders. And what's interesting about the Army's definition of leadership, which ties right into strategic leadership, is that the Army's definition has three verbs in it, influencing, operating, and improving. And a strategic leader has to be characterized by thinking, influencing, and behaving. Okay, and so uh, it's just that definition, but it's just elevated with a couple of different words into a different context. So it's a very interesting, I think, and, and, um, and, and elegant you know, uh, kind of transition into a strategic framework or a strategic level of, of leading. And I'll contend here again, it's not about the individual leader, it's about individual organizations that assume responsibility for making the organization available and, and uh, productive enough to accomplish the goal, its goals. So you're going to have leaders that are there that are different levels that, one, if they have a clear vision, they understand the values, and they develop the expertise, they can collaborate at many different levels and influence the higher level organizational leaders to provide that capacity and competency to move forward. So uh, one, one of the things we tried to do today is, is to talk about a strategic leader or leader uh, as, as somebody who's characterized by things that are enduring and things that are, are emerging. Okay. Um, when I did the ATLDP study with the, with, with the Army, this is back in 2000, 2002, one of our research, one of, our, uh, one of the things that, that emerged in research was thinking about, how, thinking about what are the characteristics of leadership or leaders. Uh, and so there were three things that came out of that. One is uh, leaders, leading is a valued, values-based proposition, and that never changes. It, it, it doesn't matter whether you're at a, leading at a platoon level of, of just 15 or, or 20 people, 30 people, or at the Army level. You know, uh, it's, about, it's a values-based proposition. Your values, your core identity matter, okay? Who you are, your, your character is really important. And then there's research-oriented, uh, research-based principles, okay? And that's, you know, being open to the fact that there's a lot of research going on and are coming up with different ways of thinking about leadership that you have to be open to, you know, to, to, to enhance the, the, the kind of competency and skill sets that you have. And the third thing is, is basically strategy-based, okay? As Chuck talked about with VUCA, you know, VUCA, the VUCA, scanning and assessing the VUCA world is important because it gives us insight around what are what are things our leaders are going to have to be able to do? So here's an example. Um, Marty Dempsey, my West Point classmate, uh, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, partnered with a guy named Ari Brothman. He wrote a book called Starfish and the Spider, which I think Marty thought was, was a wonderful metaphor to think about the emerging nature of the military. And so they partnered to write a book called Radical Inclusion. Okay, and what they what they their premise is is that the, the nature of the world is so different, the VUCA world, in terms of interconnectivity, the use of the internet, uh, Instagram, that information something can happen in the world, and w within a matter of seconds or minutes, the narrative is already out there, and it may be the wrong narrative. I mean, he had so many experiences where the wrong narrative got out, but it's it's repeated and retexted so often, so fast that it influences behavior in sometimes inappropriate ways. 
And so that environment requires that leaders be really inclusive, radically inclusive, to make sure they get all the narratives so they can actually construct the most accurate, the most truthful one to base their actions on. Because if you're not careful, you can end up doing a lot of bad things because you're operating on, on the absolute wrong narrative. You know, so that's the capacity of leaders to understand the nature of how the, the environment's changing. And then that it, inclusion has always been important, but maybe it needs to be at a more radical level to include more people involved in the conversation. So as you talk about strategic leadership here again, we think there's three major categories of leadership at that level in terms of things you should be able to be, know, and do. But, but I, I think one of the things that the, that the Army has done uh, in their leadership doctrine, which has been around. I mean, FM 22-6, where the original was written back in the 1970s, Mac Harris wrote it, and we've carried this forward. But Mac Harris introduced this notion of be no do for using Joshua Chamberlain mm -hmm. and the Battle of Gettysburg and that way he operated. And, uh, and it's, what's interesting about it is that he took very complex research-based based material and turned it into a very simple three-word acronym that leaders have to be, know, and do. Okay, and, and that's true no matter where you are, whether you're a young squad leader and you're a sergeant or whether you're a general officer, you have to be a certain kind of person, know certain kinds of stuff, and be able to do certain kind of things. And that changes with hierarchy, okay? But the framework is the same, right? And so, um, uh, and the core of that is your character, which is who you are, that's the B piece, and no and do is about competence. So it's character and competence required up and down the chain of command. Okay, it's not like, like all of a sudden I need competence. I'm a strategic leader. I need character. You, you, that's something you start, you build throughout your your journey in organizational life, at least I think. Uh, and so um, I guess that was one of the drivers here is to get our people in the session to recognize the fact that they're working on strategic leadership right now if they're working on just being a good leader in their organizations. Because it'll be an enabler later on when they have to make some higher level decisions that have strategic impact. It gets at a little different conversation that's not irrelevant. That's about leader development and developmental systems. Okay, the Army, from my point of view, and, and, and I'm sure Chuck will agree with this, has the most comp, the most detailed, integrated leader development system on the planet. You know, uh, they're really good at it because leadership fundamentally matters in the profession when, you, when it comes to life and death issues. Leaders matter. Uh, and so um, we have a, a very elaborate leader development system that before we ask any leader to be responsible for the lives of others, whatever level, we make sure they are actually absolutely ready to execute those responsibilities. And it's up to the, the, the institution to prepare them for it, which is a, a, a commitment. Typically, people get leadership positions in other organizations right around age 30. Okay. But they don't get their first leadership, educational, or training intervention until age 40, 42. So they spend a lot of time without the frameworks, without the knowledge. It's because the organization doesn't, doesn't provide the things that they need to be effective. Okay, and so um, uh, for organizations to, to be effective in today's VUCA world, they need to build a leader development succession planning system in which they're robustly committed to enabling others. It's very hard to ask people to do X kinds of stuff if they're not ready for it. I provided an example where I was strategically ignorant because mm -hmm. I was in a position that I wasn't ready for because I didn't have the intellectual frameworks to think my way through what I was doing. And it wasn't my fault necessarily. The organization elevated me so quickly that they didn't prepare me for that elevation. So I was limited in my capacity for, for understanding. I think in, orga in organizations, they have to really be more thoughtful about how they develop their capital and not expect people can lead because you say now you're a leader. It's much, much more than just declaring that someone can lead. It's, it requires a lot of learning and experience to back that up. So in the U.S. military here again, leadership is an integral part of what we do. Through the selection of individuals to join the service, we look at their background, their behaviors in high school and in college. And we're picking them based upon certain attributes that they have. And then every educational program we have, either training or institutional, we're going to have some leadership component of that. We're going to help them understand human nature and motivation. We're going to give them a set of tasks and skills to practice. And then at every level, when you go back to institutional educational program, there'll be a specific block of instruction on leadership. And then in operational units and activities, we're going to ask who's in charge, what's your morale and your cohesion, and how are you accomplishing your tasks? This is consistent as we go through our careers in the military in the process. 
And even at the Army War College, we have a separate block of instruction on strategic leadership that's about 18 lessons, so you're talking 50 or 60 hours. Even though our folks have been very successful in the past 18 or 20 years in service, we know that they need something else to move to the next level. Uh, we use a book by Marshall Goldsmith. The title was, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And part of this idea for our students is to provide some self-awareness of a new set of competencies and skills that are required and give them a chance to practice that in an environment that is psychologically safe and to test the theories and practical application. So we'll find consistently is that leadership is something that you have to practice. That's what we call a competency. And you have to be held accountable for the results that you get. We talk about the big component of leadership. It's about the character that you have in terms of attributes, who you are. It's about your intellect, your cognitive capacity, and your flexibility and agile mind. And it's also about presence. When you're there, can people gain something from your engagement, your interaction, your climate in order to one, be part of the organization, be committed to the values, but also the tasks, and two, to persevere during some very, very tough times. I think that applies consistently across other domains and organizations. This idea that we want you to have a set of values that drive your behavior and decisions. Yeah. We want you to be responsible for the folks who are around you. We want you to be able to wrestle with tough issues that, again, have no clear or easy solutions and be able to work with others to arrive at something that gives us a better state in the future. There's one word, I think, to follow up on what Chuck just said, that differentiates the military from other organizations. It's called intentionality. You know, we fundamentally believe that leadership matters. And so there's a very intentional system in place to develop leadership. It's not left up to hope. You know, we're going to put you in a leadership job and we'll let you flounder around for a while. We'll see how you do kind of thing, which is also, which is, can, be, can be effective in a way, learn, learning by doing, but it's also inefficient and can be really ineffective in the short term. And so we, we have a very intentional system, which I think most organizations could benefit from, is having a truly thoughtful, intentional way they, they're developing their leaders uh, versus leaving it up to some boss to do it who may not, in fact, engage in any of that. We have a system in place that makes it intentional. And that's important. The idea of leadership, there, I think, the civilian perspective, the leadership is focused on combat operation. We know that folks work in the Pentagon that are doing staff work, they're helping with acquisition, they're trying to develop concept. I would think that the leadership is an important process there too to be able to implement, to figure out what's important, understand the environmental factors that might challenge our ability to get things done, and to come up with new ideas. And we'll find not only do we have to have leadership within combat organizations or the operational force, it's also to have it, important to have it within the enterprise. You want to have your three and four star officers that are trying to figure out personnel management system, finance, acquisition, to think broad thoughts, to be challenged in some of the current ways of doing things, to be able to collaborate across services, we call that joint, and be able to work with other partners outside of the military, so within the U.S. government, but also multinational organizations. So boundary spanning, being aware of that, is also key, and that's inherent to this thing called strategic leadership. It's more than just you and your organization. It's about your contribution to the society and to the nation. I can talk about the definition of strategic okay. leadership as yeah. from the U.S. Army War College, this idea that there is a, it is a process that you're trying to achieve a clearly established and accepted vision. It's about influencing the organizational culture that people will, will operate with underneath. It's about outlining certain policy and directive to accomplish the key mission and tasks. It's also about building consensus of members of the organization, but also folks outside your organization. And we do it in an environment that is VUCA. Again, this idea that you can't control it, you have to understand what it is and then negotiate it in the process. And what you're trying to establish is a competitive environment for your organization or institution or even your nation in the process. The, the, here, here are the components for me, is that one of the things that leaders need to be able to do is, is, is have, is have is, is a vis, is a vision mission thing, mm -hmm. okay? Whether one comes before the other, we can argue that. But um, one of the emerging leadership requirements is to be able to tell a story, a compelling story of a future state, okay, which is challenging when the future state's uncertain when it's compared by. But leaders need to do that. You know, what, what is the future state? We, we've been unable to do that with Iraq and Afghanistan right now. We don't know what that future story looks like. I remember my classmate Dave Petraeus asking a reporter one time, is, what, what, is the, what is the end? What's the end going to look like? He, he wasn't sure. Okay, and so uh, you have to have a compelling vision of the future and, and then a mission statement, which basically is 
a backward planning process from the future state you want and what are the steps it's going to take to get to that, okay? And that's all grounded in your value set. You know, it's your, it's your organizational value, it's your individual and organizational values, okay? And that, once you have that done, you can then build a strategy, how we're going to get there, and then you can build the actual specific detailed plan of getting to that end state. So that's sort of the way things go here in, in terms of how I look at, you know, it's vision, mission, always, always focused on, val always grounded in values that leads to a, a, a notion of how we're, of how we're going to get to where we're going to go, the strategy to get there that includes, that directly includes all players in this, and then, uh, and, and then building the specific plan that you can execute against that, against that strategy, you know. Um, so that's to me what, what it sort of looks like. Is it, is so yeah, yeah. And so Simon Sinek talks about uh, start with why. If you have a vision for the future, the question is, what's your purpose, and as it serves the stakeholders and your your customer base or in, or in, in business, it's this idea that where you're trying to head has to be clearly established. But what we'll find here again in the vocal environment is that sometimes that goal that you've established will shift. So it's not a point target, it's probably more of an area target that you're trying to get to. So you need to adjust, again, how you move along the organization, the how piece, with your why. What's your purpose? We'll also find that in organizations, people have to understand not only what they're going to do and how they're going to do it, but the purpose behind that. So you're trying to get that commitment and understanding that the process is not about complying, it's about being committed to that task. And I think that happens not only in highly structured organizations, but also in matrix organizations. They figured out what the story is, what the purpose is, and they've also figured that they can't do it by themselves. Leadership is about working with other people and then may even be shared. There may be a time for a leader to ascend and be in charge or for let someone else ascend and for that leader to diminish in the process. What you're trying to find is the best combination of people that form a team to realize a very strong potential to get things done. So I, my intellectual challenge in this, when we were launched on this task back later, later part of the summer was figure out how to, how to make all this understandable in a very short period of time. So I built one slide, okay? And for me, when you look at strategic leaders, uh, they, they can be sort of described along three lines. One is they have to be known, to, which we sort of unpacked just a little bit, all right? The second thing is they, they, they have to, they have to, they're characterized by, um, by acting, uh, by, by knowing, by, act, by uh, behaving, and by influencing, okay? Uh, and then they have to, to um, uh, direct, align and get folks to commit, all right? Um, th those are the things that I was able to discover that really characterize strategic leadership. And when you, when you lay that out that way, what you discover is that's the kind of behavior that any leader needs to be able to do. They need to, they need to know who they are. They need to be absolutely self-aware. They need to know, they need to be aware of uh, what they know and what they don't know and how that relates to their job. And then be able to do the right things. They have the knowledge skills demonstrate the competencies, capabilities, capacities, and the skill set to, to do their job. Not somebody else's job, but their job. Okay, uh, and, um, uh, and, 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 and then be able to organize effort of everybody else to accomplish, you know, so you know who you are, you walk into your, your leader, you show up cl with clear awareness, you're able to influence others, okay, to accomplish desired organizational goals. Uh, and, you, and, you, and you do that through building Trust, and one of the things we talked about as strategic leader is the fact that they have to really build trust. Our, our, that those we're working with have to fundamentally trust us uh, and what we're about, both at, both as a as a nation, for example, but also in the collective nature of who we're working with. Do the Turks trust us right now? Do the Kurds trust us right now? You know, the answer to that probably is not not so much. Okay, and so now we've already broken one of the most important things about leadership is the fundamental lack of trust. Without trust, you can't get anything done. And so um, as part of the influencing process, um, for example, leaders influence others usually without authority. We don't have any authority over the Kurds in Turkey. We have no authority over the Syrians, no authority over a lot of the players in the Middle East. We have to operate them through the capacity to influence, which comes from our value set from our capacity to be trusted, you know, uh, from our clarity in why we're there and what we're trying to do to help them. And, and so, um, I mean, these are, to me, these are principles associated with leaders across all levels. 
they're just, they just become magnified in a strategic context, you know. And uh, when you, do, you don't get something wrong, it's on the front page news. If you, if you don't, you know, if we don't get it right, then we're in big trouble. You know, pe people have to get rid of the notion that they operate in silos. You know, that I as a leader am in total certain control of my world, because you're not. Yeah, and you you got to let go of control and recognize that you have to create a, an ecology in which people are are interdependent. They collaborate. They share information. They're 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 all tied into a shared purpose. I mean, McChrystal discovered that in Afghanistan. Without a shared purpose and shared consciousness, nothing good happens. You know, when you have multiple players in an organization, you have to make sure everybody understands what we're about. Okay, and then they see that what they do is really meaningful and has value. They feel respected or appreciated for who they are, and, they can, and they're contributing in a way to a meaningful, significant kind of operation. Okay, uh, and that, you know, that's, that's just fundamental to a, effective leadership, whether you're at the tactical or operational level, strategic level. As you talk about this no component of be, no, do, I think it's important for leaders to recognize that they can't know all the information that's there, and so they have to be a little bit vulnerable, but also have some humility. And this idea that they have to, one, invest in studying and understanding the environments and the activities that are important to their tasks, but also recognizing that there are other people that are within the organization and outside the boundaries that may have information that they don't have that will be useful to help either address or solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So that humility is a big piece and the ability to be agile enough to learn and then being adaptive to what you've actually learned that should influence your decisions. I think sometimes what leaders have a very strong ego. They've been raised in a culture that what the leader says at the, at the top of the pyramid is what we do. And they have a hard time pulling back from this control and also sharing leadership information with other folks in the institution, organization. Yeah. It's very interesting. At, at, a, at, if you, at a squad level, we have 10 people. You know, you can exercise huge control because the, the amount of information that you need that's relevant to that squad is probably up. It's probably smaller, and you can know a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But as you move up, that information becomes broader, the skill sets become broader, and you have to let go of control. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of our leaders in the Army spend so much time in tactical units where control matters that they don't ever relinquish that because it gets, it's what gets them promoted and advanced. You know, it's just a capacity to control. And as Chuck pointed out with the book that they use, The War College, what got you here won't get you there is the transition that folks have to make is this transition from a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. During principles still matter, but I've got to think about them in a different context, you know, and, and go from, a contr from controlling to n n lack of control, less control, you know, from, from being a little bit arrogant to a lot more humility and vulnerability because of the fact that, that the funnel is much, much bigger and I can't control it, I can't know it, and I have to rely on others, which take some work, you know. Um, but, but I think what's happened, though, is that funnel, funnel of complexity is, is dumping more complexity at lower levels than it ever used to be. You know, um, people make decisions at small organization levels that have strategic impact if they're not careful because of the nature of communication, nature of technology. Someone, someone lets that information about a stock price or about a potential purchase that's done at a low level can blow up a company, you know, depending on how that gets out, you know. So, um, you have to, I think you have to have clarity at even lower levels about the impacts of the things that you do that are beyond your own world that actually affect in second and third order ways the rest of the organization. And Joe made the comment that leadership is a value-based activity. So when we have values of so things that will drive your behavior, what we might see consistently is that leaders say one thing and do something else. Or they'll ask for one thing and reward something else. So part of this process is that ethics has to have a strong role in our decision-making process, but also our behaviors and action. So I think when we talk about strategic leadership, the need to collaborate, to include other people, to be able to focus on what's important, that collaboration and humility of letting other folks be part of the process is a key thing for senior leaders. It's, it's knowledge, skills, competencies, capabilities, you know, that define the, the they define the, the, the knowledge space of any given leader. And that knowledge space grows as you move up the strategic hierarchy. You know, uh, the, the quantity of knowledge, quant the type and quantity of knowledge is different.
Okay, but they still have to demonstrate the right knowledge, skills, and abilities for that particular job that they're in. In the military, um, I, I, my wife and I just, we, I moved probably over 20 times in the military in, th in a 34 year career, uh, which is a lot. And inside that 24 moves to different stations, I also probably had another two times more jobs. You know, and so the military is very good about working you through a lot of different jobs so you build that, that competency set, that knowledge set, that skill set. Because you're constantly having to, to reconfigure yourself and, re and, and learn new things because they keep changing. And it's, it's done very intentionally. You know, you may be in a job for six months or a year and they put you in another position. You know, you gotta start, you gotta sort of gotta start from scratch to build your set. And the more experiences they can give you, the, the more you build that competency set. So what we have here again is this focus on competencies. We'll come up with a list of competencies that can cover the whole landscape, which makes it not useful. But there are certain things that should be in place. The categories should be conceptual. Can you think? And what's your frame of reference? Are you always updating, refining that? How do you address problems that arise? Are you overwhelmed by them? Or can you manage the problems rather than try to solve them? And then you have this vision of what should be accomplished and how to get there. There has to be a technical expertise that you have to understand new systems and new processes and invest the effort in that. And then we think that kind of the qualitative difference between a very successful senior leader, strategic leader, will be the interpersonal piece, the ability to build consensus with team members, either inside the organization or outside the organization. The idea that they have to negotiate and compromise to find a better solution or a shared purpose, and then the ability to communicate effectively not only inside the organization, but also outside the organization. Again, you can have a series of technical skills for each of those categories, but the overall category is important. Are you a good thinker and can you adjust and adapt? Uh, do you have the knowledge base or ability to understand systems that are in place? And then can you actually work with other people and then co influence, not coerce, influence them to be part of the solutions that the team that moves forward? Developing leaders, there's some, rule, there's some rules of the road that are out there for developing leaders. and they're, you know, it's, it's about intentionality, it's about ownership, and about accountability. Got to be intentional. Folks got to own their developmental journey. You got to hold them accountable for their journey. And all three of those things exist in the world of the military. You know, uh, our intentional systems are built around a 70-20-10 kind of conceptual framework. That 70% of your growth as a leader occurs through the experiences we provide to you. Uh, our job, the military's job, is to put people in challenging experiences that stretch their capacity with the intention of enabling them to move to the next position or the next two positions, okay? So challenging experiences. The second piece is, is the schoolhouse, is training and readiness, training and education, all right? And that's, that's a 10% proposition. So um, I, I look at my own journey of the mil in the military for 34 years. I probably spent six years in school, getting both a master's and a PhD, war college, Vangelo Staff College, and all my other combat arms training programs. Uh, and then the third piece of that is 20% are, are feed, feedback and coaching and mentoring from other leaders. Uh, and so if that design exists in the, in the military profession and it's intentional and it's done because we're, we're interested in making sure that we have the right people on the bench to lead. You know, the Army is interesting because unlike Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson, we can't hire laterally. You can't go, oh, we don't, we ha we, we don't have enough colonels Let's hire. We can't do that. We have to grow it. And so because of that, and not putting the, per the profession at risk and our service to the nation at risk, we have to have a very intentional process. I think most organiz other organizations don't necessarily think about their process that way. If you, if you sample CEOs, 70% will say they have either poor or non-existent succession plans. They don't know who the next generation's leaders are which then suggests they're not really developing leaders. You know, they figure, well, if we, have, if we need them, we'll go out and steal them from somebody else. We'll get them from Goldman Sachs or we'll hire them. That's not a very good recipe, you know, I think, for success when you rely on trying to get talent elsewhere when you, when you lack it. And that's what some organizations do. They don't want to invest in development. They, they'll just buy talent wherever they can find it. And most of that talent is not necessarily successful depending on where they start. They struggle. I think one of the challenges for the military is that we've had these processes we put in place for a number of years that are very bureaucratic and very industrial. And as we're thinking about leadership for the future, are there new competencies that we have to develop? Are there new ways to ex access human capital to bring into the force? So we have to change our way of thinking. Success breeds complacency, which can really uh, 
brief being irrelevant for the organization and for the institution. So how do we now challenge what we know, consistently look at that, and then we keep saying that we need to adapt and learn. Sometimes we adapt and we forget to incorporate the learning. And so part of the process for the military or any organization is to continually assess, right, monitor, and then make a decision whether to uh, do the same thing or to do something different. So it comes down to the culture. The culture of the organization is that what we do to solve day-to-day -day problems. So this expectation that you're responsible for folks who are around you is important. Uh, we've had a, the rash of sexual assault and harassment over the past decade or so that we've been dealing with. And we've gone back to the idea that the tagline is not in my squad. I'm responsible for the people that are in my orbit, my circle, to adhere to the values that we think are important. So the accountability can be top down or it can be in the essence of the organization. At the lowest level where things get done, where people identify with each other in the process. So it has to be part of the daily conversation. Uh, Ed Shine talks about primary embedding mechanisms. What are the things that leaders, leaders pay attention to? What are the rewards and consequences for behavior? And then what are the promotion systems and selection systems that are in place? Accountability means here's the standard. If you don't meet the standard, we'll give you some other programs to help you uh, compensate and mitigate that. But if you can't meet the standard according to our values, then it's time for you to lead the organization. Uh, Noel Tishy and Warren Bennis talk about the most important things that leaders, leaders do is provide judgment about three different things primarily. Judgment about people, who to bring in the organization, who to develop and who to kick out. Judgment about strategy, the direction we're gonna head and how we plan to get there and probably the most impactful ones, judgment in times of crisis. When bad things happen, and not if, what are the principles and values that drive the decisions of leaders in your organization? And the, those decisions and those behaviors in times of crisis is what organizational members see, what they learn, and what they replicate. So the values-based aspect of leadership has to be part of the daily conversation so that when you get to tough times, People don't have to ask you what to do. They know what the right thing is. And they're responsible for folks who are around them to hold them accountable in the process. And the time you prepare yeah. for a crisis is not during the crisis. Yeah. You do that by setting the foundation to the organizational experiences, the trust that you build with each other, and the expectation yeah. that when things go wrong, I can trust the person to my left, to my right, and I should be able to trust my leaders to do the right thing. And expediency, short-term focus, um, avoiding pain is not acceptable. I, I ran the, the Coach K Fellowship at Fuqua, at Fuqua um, for 13 years, and it's a group of specially selected MBA students, first years, who served in their second year. Uh, and so, in, the, in that process, I, I got a chance to hear, hear Mike Shashevsky speak a lot, and he 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 is pretty interesting when he talks about issues like accountability. He's often asked, what do, you, what do you do in a crisis? And he'll say, it's too late. Mm -hmm. you, what you want in a crisis is a team that fundamentally trusts one another. Okay, now how do you build that trust? Well, one of the things he talks about is accountability. Is, is, is are you able as a leader to, to clearly articulate what the standards of behavior are, make sure everybody understands those standards, and when they don't meet the standards, you, you have a system in place that holds them, that, 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 gives, that gives them opportunities to meet the standard. There's a consequence to not do doing the right thing. It started for me as a young private when I the Army in the late 1960s. You know, I was held accountable for my own behavior on the part of the drill sergeant, but also accountable by my buddies when I screwed up, you know, and they, and they had to suffer the consequences of my behavior. And so you have to build it into your system. You have to build it into the, your, as, as Chuck mentioned, the, your organizational culture. This is a culture of accountability. It's important that we get along, but what's more important is that we get it right. Well, you know, we get it right against the standards and we get it right with each other. And that, be, that comes through practice. You have to practice becoming accountable. I think organizations get in trouble when they, when they have a lack of clarity in standards. You know, what is the right thing to do? Because if you don't know what the right standard is, then it becomes very hard to hold someone accountable if they didn't know what the standard was. And they have no way to measure their behavior against uh, you know, a, a statement of, acceptable behavior at, at whatever level it, it ha that behavior has to be at so the organization can be effective. You know, and so I think it all starts from 
clarity on standards and enforcement of those standards without question, you know, to build the right muscle, you know. Uh, if you don't have the right standards in place or you don't have people who are enacting the standards that you think are important, then your organization will lose alignment in terms of the strategy and what drives and motivates people. It'll lose uh, alignment in terms of the processes that you put in place to accomplish certain things for the, the stakeholders or the clients. So what we'll find consistently is that we'll have organizations that will say all the right things. They'll have the nice glossy flyers. They'll have the banner on the elevator door. They'll have uh, little tags that you'll wear. And people will look at those things and understand exactly what was being said, but they'll watch the behaviors that happen in your organizations. And the tendency is to role model and follow the behaviors of leaders in your organization. So accountability has to be part of the process of organizational life and the standards, and then you can't have the complacency assume that just because we went through this one time, we had our annual training on ethics, that it's gonna stick during tough times. You have to practice that and build the trust with other members of the organization and leaders in the organization to figure out, to know what the right thing is, and then have the moral courage and the fortitude to persist to accomplish the right thing in the right, in the right way. For, for me, uh, this is what I think is most important about the conversation we had or just about leadership in general. First of all, leading is a choice. Okay, you've got to choose to lead. Um, and uh, But once you make the choice to lead, it becomes hard and inconvenient for you as the leader. It's a hard and inconvenient business because as a leader, you're on stage, you're a leader 24-7. It's not just when you're at work. You lead when you're not at work. You lead in the community. You, you lead wherever you influence others. And so it's this commitment to a special kind of behavior. And so because of that, uh, and because of the nature of what, what leaders, how they influence organizations, people line up to join your organization because they want to follow you as leader. And so when that happens, it also creates an obligation, a commitment, almost a marriage, you know, a marriage promise, that you promise a certain kind of, of operational environment for these folks because they've chosen to join you. So hard, inconvenient, 24-7, it's a promise. And because of that, you have to really know what you're doing, all right? And so you have to really prepare for your role as leader, all right? Um, uh, I think one of the great obligations of leaders is to, is, to, is to read, is to study, is to really in, in endeavor to become better and not wait for opportunities, but actually create your own developmental conditions and not wait for the organization to do it because it matters that much. So for me, the big takeaway for leadership is that leadership matters, but it only matters not for you. It matters for the people that we serve. Uh, leaders, again, are put in position not because of who they are, but their ability to help other people accomplish tasks, achieve goals, and provide value. So as I think about leadership at the strategic level, at the direct level, and the organizational level, it is understanding their role in providing value to an external organization, there's an expression that an organization's purpose does not reside within itself. So as a leader, we're trying to provide some value to an external organization or society, and we also have an obligation to help develop members of the organization to achieve their purpose. Uh, some folks will judge organizational success by how long someone stays. Within the military, we have folks that rotate out every year, so maybe 30 or 40% of our workforce transitions out, some folks will leave voluntarily, some will get kicked out. What we want to have happen is that the people that were in the military or an organization value their time there and their contributions so they become the best recruiters for this service to other folks in their family and their society. So for me, that's the mark of a successful leader, not only providing value to those things outside the organization, but also developing people that have a sense of pride, a commitment, and they got the character to do the right things in very difficult circumstances.